Before we get into today's case, I want to thank the sponsor of this video, Aura. If you haven't heard of Aura, it's an awesome app that protects you online and has a ton of great features. Aura monitors a dark web to see if your personal information is leaked and it can even monitor your credit accounts and alerts you to suspicious activity. You can also scan your devices for malware, ransomware, viruses and more. One thing I especially like is the one-click secure VPN so I can shop, bank and browse online securely and privately. It's great that Aura is really easy to set up and has everything you need so you don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, ID theft, transaction monitoring and more. You get everything at one affordable price. Make sure to check out Aura and protect yourself and your family from the online threats. Browse safely and surf smarter. Go to my sponsor, aura.com forward slash briefcase to get a 14 day free trial and see if your personal information has been compromised. Today we will be going back to the early 19th century and for the first time on this channel, we will be going to Iceland. Agnes Magnus Dotter was born in Iceland on the 27th of October 1795. Her parents were unmarried farmers and at a very young age, her father abandoned her and her mother. By the time Agnes had reached the age of six, she had been fostered by a pair of tenant farmers who lived in another village in the northern part of the country. At the time, Iceland was a territory of Denmark, as it had been for several centuries. This governance arrangement meant that the Danish monarch had significant authority over Icelandic affairs. These included political and economic matters. Danish officials oversaw the administration of the island, and the Danish crown influenced the policies and procedures. In 1820, when Agnes was 25 years old, the country faced significant challenges particularly for its less privileged residents. The majority of the population was primarily engaged in agriculture and fishing, which were crucial for the economy. A major issue for those who were economically disadvantaged was the difficulty of agriculture. Many Icelanders relied on farming, trying to make a living in a challenging natural environment. The country's unique geography, including its harsh climates and frequent volcanic activity, made farming uncertain and precarious. Crop failures due to cold weather or volcanic eruptions were common, and this often resulted in food shortages that disproportionately affected the poor. For those already living in poverty, such setbacks were particularly devastating. Adding to the challenges was Iceland's isolation. The island's remote location limited its contact with the outside world. This made it difficult for the impoverished to access essential resources that could improve their lives, and the country remained largely disconnected from the rapid changes and progress occurring on the European mainland. There was a lack of economic diversification, which meant that the poor had few options for improving their financial situation. They were often trapped in a cycle of poverty, with little hope of escaping, especially as the economy was primarily based on agriculture and fishing with few industrial or commercial ventures to speak of. Many people lived in turf houses, which though providing some insulation from the harsh climates, they were cramped and sanitation was rudimentary, which contributed to the spread of diseases, especially in the capital Reykjavik, which was the most densely populated area. The scarcity of educational access perpetuated the vicious cycle of poverty as individuals had fewer opportunities to acquire the essential skills and knowledge required for improving work prospects and a chance of escaping the clutches of poverty. In this socio-economic hierarchy, a small elite class held all the wealth and power, making it difficult for the poor to improve their social and economic standing. Many were dependent on the goodwill of landowners for work and supports, leaving them vulnerable to exploitation Agnes grew up during a time of economic struggle. Although there is little information recorded about her early years, we can presume that her childhood was marked by hard work and poverty, which were common experiences for many people of her era. However, Agnes's life took a significant turn when she met Natan Ketilsson. He was a landowner 
and prosperous farmer, making him relatively wealthy in comparison to the majority of the population. What drew Agnes to Natan was not only his social standing, but also his diverse skills. Beside his farming activities, he claimed to be a self-taught doctor and herbalist. Even though Agnes worked doing domestic chores, Natan encouraged her intellectual development. He told her about the European mainland, the large cities with their romantic charm, cobbled streets and elegant boulevards. He painted a picture that was far removed from the daily struggles of poverty and hard labour that had characterised her early years. Through him, she realised that there was a possibility of finding a better life for herself. However, rumours soon started that Natan and Agnes had began some sort of romantic involvement. Although many people thought this strange, as they were aware that Natan was in fact in love with another woman, a well-known local poet named Scalta Rosa. Rosa was married, which indicated that her relationship with Natan may have been complicated. While it wasn't openly straightforward, it was not a hidden secret either. In fact, the local community knew about it, and they were aware that Natan was the father of two of Rosa's children. This complex and intertwined romantic relationship added an element of intrigue and gossip to the lives of those who lived nearby. To further add to the complexity, it was rumoured that Natan was also conducting a relationship with another one of his maids, a 17-year-old named Sigrior Gumans Dottir. On the 14th of March 1828, Agnes ran to Scapacot Farm to report her far in the house where she worked. She shouted that two people were trapped inside and that the building was burning very quickly. Rescuers soon arrived to extinguish the blaze, but to their horror, they discovered two badly burnt corpses who were later identified to be Natan Ketilson, the farm's owner, and a guest who had recently arrived, named Petil Jonsson. Initially, it was assumed that the two men had tragically perished in the fire, but further investigation revealed a more unsettling truth. They had suffered multiple stab wounds and blunt force trauma, possibly caused from a hammer, before the fire was deliberately set. The use of shark oil to ignite the flames suggested an attempt to cover up the gruesome crime and sent shockwaves through the tranquil community. The authorities wasted no time in arresting Agnes Magnus Dottir and young Siglior Gumans Dottir, along with a young man named Friedrich Sigurdsson. After questioning the three suspects, they were all charged with murder. The Icelandic community was shocked and saddened by the double murder, but the revelation that two young women and a young man may have orchestrated it only added a layer of astonishment that reverberated throughout the island. Although the motives behind the actions of the three accused remained unclear, local people couldn't help but speculate that their tangled romantic relationship might have played a role in the crime. A few weeks after the murder, when the people had returned to their normal business and the names of Agnes, Sigrior and Friedrich were no longer the only topic of conversation, Natan's long-term female companion, the renowned poet Skelt Rosa, penned the following verse, which captured the complex emotions that had gripped the community in the wake of the tragedy. Don't be surprised by the sorrow in my eyes, nor at the bitter pangs of pain that I feel, for you have stolen with your scheming, he who gave my life meaning, and thrown your life to the devil to deal. Following this, the murders were once again at the forefront of everyone's mind. The trial began on the 14th of March 1830. Agnes, Friedrich and the young maid Siglior stood at the centre of a grave accusation. The brutal murder of two men at an isolated farmstead nestled in the heart of Vastel Sola. There was considerable public interest and scrutiny not only due to the heinous nature of the crime, but also because it involved two women of such humble origins. The legal proceedings were conducted in a manner typical of the time. A panel of judges, local officials and landowners presided over the trial. Witnesses were called and evidence was presented. The atmosphere was tense as the fate of Agnes and her co-accused 
hung in the balance. Agnes herself was portrayed as a woman of low social standing, her reputation tarnished by her alleged involvement in an illicit affair with Natan. The motives for this callous act primarily revolved around the belief that the accused had conspired to steal from Natan, a figure regarded as a wealthy landowner. Authorities contended that Friedrich had become infatuated with Sigrior and grew resentful upon discovering her intimacy with Natan. It was believed that Friedrich was the mastermind behind the murders, although prosecutors failed to present many details about exactly how he was to blame. The trial lasted for some time and was eventually sent to the Supreme Court in Copenhagen. Following this, the three accused were all found guilty and sentenced to death. The guilty verdict and the passing of the death sentence marked a solemn and heart-wrenching conclusion to the trial that had captured the attention of the whole nation. It was later announced that Siglior's sentence would be commuted to life in prison, which he would serve in Denmark. As the execution date approached, every farm owner was told to send a male representative to witness the events. Agnes and Friedrich were to be executed by public beheading by means of a special axe that had been imported from Denmark. The act was orchestrated by Natan's brother and in a chilling sequence, Friedrich was led to the executioner's block where his life was brutally ended. Agnes, his accomplice, stood nearby, her eyes locked on the grisly scene. Just moments later, the same grim fate awaited her, making Agnes Magnus Dotta the last person to be executed in Iceland. Both Agnes and Friedrich were denied a Christian burial, their transgressions apparent. Instead, their severed heads were cruelly mounted on pikes, exposed to public view along the roadside. Yet within a mere day, the macabre trophies vanished and eluded the authorities' desperate search. An investigation proved futile, and for a century, the whereabouts of the heads remained an enigma. In 1930, a local woman came forward with an astonishing claim. She had been visited by the spirit of Agnes. She divulged the head's hidden location, unveiling the long-lost remains. The identity of the thieves shrouded in mystery, a local legend whispered of a compassionate housewife who felt compelled to bury the heads herself. In a poignant ceremony, Agnes and Friedrich, who had initially been interred near the execution site, found rest at last. Their bodies were reunited with their heads and received a dignified burial in a local churchyard. The story of Agnes Magnus Dottir and the gruesome double murder has etched itself into legend thanks to numerous books and documentaries which recount the ruthless actions of a 33-year-old woman who many deemed to have been a malevolent and a veritable monster. In the early days of September 2017, a makeshift courtroom materialised within the community centre in a village situated near the very location where the two unfortunate souls met their grim fates. Here, using original documents from the 1828 investigation, the case underwent a retrial with the primary aim of unearthing the motivations that drove Agnes and her accomplices to commit this terrible act. There were suggestions that Agnes and her fellow maid may have endured mistreatment at the hands of Natan Ketilsson and that his alleged abuse might have driven two desperate young women to commit this terrible deed. The unique mock trial was meticulously orchestrated by the Icelandic Legal Society, employing a contemporary legal framework and modern day procedures to re-examine this historic case. The final verdict, delivered by a panel of three judges, led to a 14-year prison sentence for Agnes, effectively sparing her from the death penalty. The trial of Agnes Magnus Dottir serves as a stark reminder of the legal practices and societal norms that were prevalent in the early 19th century, shedding light on the harsh conditions and limited legal rights faced by individuals during that era. The axe head used for the beheading is displayed at Iceland's National Museum and serves as a tangible reminder of an event that happened in a dark chapter in the nation's history. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. I recently went to Iceland 
and I'd like to say a big thank you to two young ladies, whose name I don't know, who worked for the Reykjavik Maritime Museum, and they were so nice and helped me with all the pronunciations for today's case. Please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and hope to see you all again in the next brief case.